to call attention for all here to please take their seats. And we have a very eminent faculty, including Dr. Jose Polito, who is the professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Molecular Medicine in Mayo Clinic. Dr. Bill Miller from Chicago. Dr. Santosh Onawa from Center for Sight, Hyderabad. Dr. Vikramjeet Pal and Dr. Prithvi from Stanford. I request all the speakers to be on the stage. We'll have the talks. The time for the talks is about 10 minutes. And we hope to include a couple of questions at the end of the talk. So I request Dr. Santosh to conduct the session. Thank you. We're just about to start. First speaker is uh, Pukraj Rishi. He'll speak on biopsy techniques for intraocular tumors, and he'll showcase examples as well. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. And uh, good morning, all. I'll be speaking on intraocular biopsy techniques. Even as we uh, diagnose most of the tumors with the clinical features and imaging techniques, Biopsy is still required to diagnose some atypical tumors. So, tissue is the issue in such situations. Okay. And in the next few slides, I'm going to share with you certain cases that illustrate the concepts. And these cases are being presented in an increasing order of complexity. So basically, we employ three techniques, needle cytology, excision, and incisional biopsy and tailor them to the location of the tumor, be it the anterior segment or the posterior segment. Increasingly, the role of AC tap or interior chamber tap is now being used for retinoblastoma cases to gather cell-free DNA and correlate somatic chromosomal copy number alterations with clinical outcomes, especially eye salvage. So an ocular oncologist armamentarium is simple but effective, and you can see some arrows in the quiver. So case one is that of an 84-year-old male who had presented with bilateral anterior uveitis and also had a history of hemimandibulectomy for oral carcinoma three years back. Anterior chamber tap was done to rule out a masquerade syndrome, but cytopathology revealed only macrophages and lymphocytes no malignant cells were seen. The patient was periodically followed up, and there was no intraocular malignancy. Case two is of a 57-year-old male who presented with pain, decreased vision since two weeks. He had a history of smoking five packs of cigarettes a day for the last 30 years. So examination revealed iris mass uh, and Fundus examination revealed choroidal mass with uh, exudative retinal detachment, and a PET CT scan revealed a possible lung malignancy with several metastases. So we established the tissue diagnosis and transferred the patient to the oncologist who managed him after that. So the next case is that of a 13-year-old girl who presented with pain and decreased vision of two weeks duration and fundus examination revealed vitreous hemorrhage, neovascularization at the disc and elsewhere, and inferior sectoral laser photocoagulation. Intraocular pressure was 42 because of neovascular glaucoma, and we investigated this child for possible uh, etiologies like coagulopathy, uh, paraproteinemias, or Takayasu arthritis, but everything came negative. Um, gonioscopy revealed a grayish tumor from the ciliary body, and FNAC confirmed the diagnosis of medullary epithelioma. This patient underwent plaque radiation, and uh, five years down, she is doing well. So this 40-year-old male presented with a spot in the eye, 
His visual acuity was 6x in both eyes. He was strongly positive for MAN2 test and quantiferon TB gold test was positive. So this tumor was excised, but pathology revealed only lymphocytes and plasma cells. The PCR for MTB was negative, so no further treatment was required even after the systemic investigation. So this was a 26-year-old lady who presented with decreased vision of four months duration. Her visual acuity at presentation was 618. And uh, this was a quaint tumor that we saw uh, looking to arise from the ciliary body. There is ectropy and UV, there is rubiosis, and there are some cystoid spaces uh, as seen on the UBM image. So we did the FNAC twice, but we did not gather enough material for the cytopathologist to give a feedback. So this lady underwent a partial amylar scleroeuviectomy, and on a follow-up two months later, she improved vision to 6-9. There was no recurrence. And the histopathology and immunohistochemistry revealed PAS positive for highline material in the epithelial tumor cells and it was suggestive of a ciliary body epithelial neoplasm of uncertain origin. Uh, another case of a 70-year-old lady who presented with a low-grade inflammation persisting till one year after the cataract surgery, and you can make out there's a diffuse iris bulge inferiorly, and that's better appreciated on a UBM. She was advised needle biopsy, but came back two months later with an AC granuloma, which looked like a fungal granuloma. And uh, this tumor, because it involved the ciliary body, uh, we had it removed with a partial amylar scleroeuviectomy. Here, uh, we fashion an outer scleral flap. And then, with the help of transillumination, try to get the inner scleral window, and then the tumor is excised. The inner and the outer scleral windows are sutured back, and then the granuloma was removed with a cutter, some vitrectomy, and this is uh, six months following the surgery is quiet, there is no recurrence, and the microbiology revealed a phylophora species of the fungus. So this is a rare care. The next case is of a 26-year-old lady who presented with pain and headache of one month duration. Again, you can notice ectropian uvea, rubiosis, and chocolate pressure 34, and an amelanotic ciliary body mass. So this is the fundus photo, and you can make out the mass in the temporal periphery. And again, this, um, despite FNAC, we could not get any clues. So this lady also underwent a PLSU. And uh, I'll just advance this. Uh, hypotensive general anesthesia is, um, serves well to reduce the intraocular hemorrhage and also a radio frequency cautery helps good local hemostasis. This tumor was removed in total. And the histopathology revealed cellular areas composed of spindle cells with low nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. And the immunohistochemistry was positive for S100, suggestive of benign peripheral nerve sheath tumor. This is the post-operative picture. Transvitreal biopsy for posteriorly located intraocular tumors is an uh, invaluable technique. Here you can see with the MIVS 25 gauge uh, fixing an infusion light pipe or a chandelier and using a 27 gauge cannula for the cutter. The cutter is impaled into the tumor and um, we collect the samples directly into a syringe with controlled suction. So this is a useful technique, it's quick and under direct visualization. The same technique can be applied instead of a cutter, you can use a needle 
And uh, for uh, thinner tumors, this was a case of reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. Also, this series of uh, stepwise approach to gathering a retinal tissue sample for diagnosis of retinochoroidal pathology, especially in the cases where vitreous biopsy has been negative. And uh, most often, this technique is employed to diagnose vitreoretinal lymphoma. So in conclusion, improved instrumentation and surgical techniques have made biopsy for intraocular tumors safe with regard to tumor dissemination. And having a good cytopathology backup is invaluable in the clinical service. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Rishi. We have uh, time, for, time for one quick question. Yes. Do you, do you suture your wound when you do a vitrectomy-assisted biopsy, or do you leave it um, open and dispose on its own? So not as a rule, but I would uh, be concerned about if there is a chance of an intraocular hemorrhage, and I would like to tamponade with the manual pressure um, while keeping the chandelier in for a little bit more for direct visualization. And then if there is hy persisting hypotony, I wouldn't hesitate to put a suture or two. Okay. Well, you know, I, we tend to, um, to suture all the wounds, um, and also to be extra you know, safe or very wimpy about it, I usually will cryo as cryo, well, because yeah. there's more and more evidence now of, of the risk of the instruments going in and out can be there. Now, we use cannulas, which is helpful. We're not going directly in. Um, but we just tend to suture it. I don't know if I need to do that, but I do. Yeah. So I think it's quite safe and um, to put the sutures and also do the cryo. Thank you. Uh, in the case of Kras, you can say. Yeah. Right. Uh, in the case where uh, the fungal granuloma was there, you have done the iridos, choroidal, biopsy so first yeah. and then uh, gone for could you have gone at the first attempt to remove the mass which is there on the iris rather than um, going yeah. for uh, major surgery? So the first time the patient presented, we asked her to get uh, an FNAC. So she refused. She came back two months later with deterioration. So uh, we did offer that to her. And uh, we were not sure about the diagnosis in the first instance wanted to establish a diagnosis, but uh, she patient just refused. She came back with that. Uh, but on UBM, we thought there was some ciliary body involvement. And uh, if we had an anterior approach, we might not have completely excised the tissue, leading to recurrent infections later on. So we thought a combined anterior-posterior approach would be good. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say two things? Um, number one. Um, the case of medullal epithelioma is very important because we now know that some of these patients have a familial disease associated with a dicer mutation. And these, um, these families get medullal epitheliomas and pulmonary blastomas yeah. as well. So whenever you see a rare case of medullal epithelioma, think that this patient might have a familial um, uh, problem and, and put that down. Um, the, the other thing too is you are an amazing surgeon. You did fantastic iridocyclectomies. But the question, and when I was younger, you know, the, the, the problem about iridocyclectomies is you have to be a young man to do them. Right? The eyes open and, you know, you think, oh my God, what's going to happen next? And you feel great when you do it because you know you're a darn good doctor. But the question is, nowadays, does one have to really do that? Because you can stick, you can do a, a partial thickness flap, stick a vitrector in there, get a sample, see what it is. If it's melanoma or, or, or um, something that requires radiation, you put a plaque. And you don't have to do these amazing iridocyclectomies, even though they're really cool to do. So I do agree with your line of thought. The, for particularly our kind of cases, most of them were amelanotic, 
uh, generally melanoma is uh, not as frequent in the brown races as it is in the West. So that's one. Most of the cases did undergo FNAC with inconclusive results. So uh, very less option. The one, the, the tumor that I showed you of unknown, that epithelial tumor of unknown origin, that had both cystic and solid components. Uh, that I, I wonder whether that was an RPE adenocarcinoma. Okay. I, I, I so we checked with Dr. Dross Niklaus and uh, he guided the further investigations and he asked us to do the PAS thing and then he probably thought about of this diagnosis. Perfect. So Thank you. he just followed up. Thank you so much. Uh, we invite uh, Professor Jose Pulido for the next talk on uh, advances in vitro retinal lymphoma. Uh, this side. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to come, and I'm so happy that you know um, people come up and, and introduce themselves to me because I'm kind of a shy person and and I enjoy talking to to, to people. So, um, so I'm going to talk about some new things about vitreoretinal lymphoma, and you know we know the symptoms. Um, they have floaters. They might have some decreased vision, but the vision is not as um, affected as the amount of floaters that they see. And we usually think of this as in older patients, but in immunosuppressed patient, um, people, you could see it in younger patients as well. And as I said, the vision is way better than expected with the amount of vitritis. So when you see a patient that's been told they've had uveitis, but the vitritis is way out of proportion to the vision, think of vitreoretinal lymphoma. Another thing that we've described is that these patients, unless they've had interventions before, don't have much macular edema. And that's important. And the reason is the interleukin-10 that's elevated in these patients closes the blood retinal barrier. And, and these cells want to protect themselves. The reason they're in the vitreous is they're trying to protect themselves from the immune system like I'll show you. So um, macular edema is very infrequent if the patient hasn't had interventions before. And there's four types of presentations. Um, if an eye has had, um, if, had, if it has vitreous cells and no macular edema, as I said, so here's vitreous cells, no macular edema, think of vitreoretinal lymphoma. See, there's no edema, though there's plenty of cells. Um, one of the presentations is purely vitreous cells, and this is the aurora borealis of ophthalmology. Um, and you really need to do an extensive vitrectomy in these eyes, as I'll show you later. Here's a 62-year-old lady with l these large, clumpy cells in the vitreous. Um, there can be vitreous and retinal involvement. Retinitis-like is rare. It's usually late, and patients had been treated previously with corticosteroids. Um, there's another form, uh, which is retinal, and again, you don't need to do a chorioretinal biopsy, and in these cases, there can be few vitreous cells. Now, this is very important. This is a uh, histopathology slide, and here is a case of vitreoretinal lymphoma, and you can see the large lymphoma cells um, here and um, around and under the retinal pigment epithelium, but not in Brooks' membrane. You can see the big cells um, here, but there's no big cells under Brooks' membrane. What did I tell you? The patient's lymphoma cells are trying to protect themselves from the immune system. The choroid is chock full of immune cells, all right? So you don't have to do a choroidal biopsy. A choroidal biopsy is going to just make the diagnosis that much harder because then the pathologist is going to see the normal lymphocytes and say this is a reactive um, process, okay? A retinal biopsy is all that you have to do. Here's a case of definite vitreoretinal lymphoma. And um, you can see all the layers of the retina involved. And look at that, no, no real macular edema. That's interesting. And here we did just a retinal biopsy. And you can see that Brooks' membrane is spared. And we could make the diagnosis. 
There's another form that's called clumpy, I call it clumpy subretinal um, involvement. There's no vitritis, nocardia can look like this. Get the clumps on biopsy. Again, you don't have to, you just have to stick a vitrector in there, um, into the clumps. You don't have to go through and, and take out a piece. There's indolent subretinal involvement, and usually these are the hardest ones because there's nothing to biopsy. Maybe cell-free DNA, PCR in the future might be helpful. And these are some of these cases. These are the hardest ones to diagnose. And you can see these little small areas of um, vitreoretinal uh, lymphoma. Um, and again, no macular edema is present. Here again are these little um, RPE, uh, vitreoretinal lymphoma clumps, and no macular edema. So, Making the diagnosis is easy if you have plenty of cells in the vitreous. Remember to put the um, cells in uh, RPMI media is what we use, but some kind of uh, media that allows them to live and send on ice to make a cytospin. Do not send for flow. Flow is only done to tell you that there's CD20 and you don't need, you need, you basically destroy the cells by putting them through flow. Don't use immunoglobulin rearrangement. You get false positives um, with these small samples. So here is a case where there were a lot of cells, like that 62-year-old lady. Diagnosis is easy. Big cells, vitreoretinal lymphoma. On the other hand, there's scant degenerated cells in this situation here. The retina has um, involvement. You could consider doing a retinal in, um, uh, biopsy in this case. But what we found was that there's one test that really can make the diagnosis. And when I first proposed it to the pathologist, they thought I was crazy. Um, Bill Mueller and I work together and he does think I'm crazy. Um, but the pathologist said, Jose, we'll do it for you. So this test is called Mighty 88 L265P. So this is a mutation that's seen in 92% of patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And in 15% of patients that have systemic diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So I wanted to see if this was positive in patients that had vitreoretinal lymphoma. And guess what? It only takes 10,000 cells and you can get degenerated cells, but it's positive in about 90% of cases. So if you have this one PCR test that's positive, there is nothing else in the eye that it can be but vitreoretinal lymphoma. This is a normal Mighty 88. This is a Mighty 88 L265P mutation PCR product to show you the difference. So what is Mighty 88? It's the universal adapter of the innate immune system. And when you um, went to medical school, um, you learned about the um, adaptive immune system, and the adaptive immune system is the one that kicks in with it about two weeks after you've had an infection, and it involves the, um, a T cell response and a B cell response, um, and it's a response to a specific antigen. The innate immune system happens right away, and what it responds to is a pattern, and so many things can have a similar pattern, and, and that is the in first response that one gets. So then um, with this pattern, you can see a pattern response to many of these um, different um, products. Uh, and you then need an adapter molecule, and in this case, it's Mighty 88 is the adapter molecule. And downstream, and we talked about NEMO yesterday, is um, for incontinentia pigmenti. In this case, NEMO works in a different way than yesterday, but this upregulates in inflammation. Now, with the Mighty 88 L265P mutation, you don't need the patterns getting onto the sur surface of the cell. The adapter molecule, this mutation, causes the adapter, the Mighty 88, to be on all the time. And so this cell is constantly on, and that's how it works. And um, basically, I've talked about that before. Um, I think it's important to realize in vitreoretinal lymphoma, you never can win. You can only keep the lymphoma in abeyance. 
And I've seen patients now that are 10 years out from the diagnosis, still living and still doing well. But you have to constantly fight the battle um, to win in these patients. Now, I told you that um, vitrectomy and a very good vitrectomy is very important in these patients. And this shows the reason why. These cells proliferate like crazy. KI67 is a marker for proliferation. And you can see how proliferative these cells are. So you really want to debulk the vitreous before considering either systemic, local, and or both together. So vitrectomy helps make the diagnosis and also debulks, and it might change the environment as well. And as I said, um, it's not all a panacea. Remember the case I showed you where we did the biopsy and, and made the diagnosis? Well, a year later, the uh, vitreoretinal lymphoma came back and we had to retreat, and yet the patient's continuing to do well. The last thing that I want to leave you with is the following. This is a disease, oh, my time is up. This is a disease that not only affects the eye, but the brain as well. So if you're thinking the patient has vitreoretinal lymphoma, think of CNS lymphoma, and every three months, get, a uh, get an MRI of the brain. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Polito. Can I ask him a question? He's shown us, he's, he's, he's so not shy anymore that he's uh, come to India. Um, Dr. Polito, um, you know, the, the newest thing in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is CAR T-cell technology, where um, Yaskarta has been FDA approved for refractory um, diffuse large B-cell. And again, it's not the same disease as we see because these are highly pretreated patients. Do you think that, that modified T-cells that are put back into patients um, would be effective in uh, intraocular lymphoma? Yeah. So, um, Again, this is what, what we've shown, what will be coming out in the American Journal of Hematology in this, this December issue in about a week, um, is that this is a, a disease where we're winning, but we haven't won. And um, the patients are living at least five years. Um, but you have to constantly change what you do. I think the CAR T cells is, is kind of cool because it is a systemic disease and you might take out the problems in the periphery. But remember, the problem about the CAR T cells is getting into the eye. So they've developed the interleukin 10 to close the blood retinal barrier. So those CAR T cells, they might be in the choroid, but they're not gonna get into the vitreous. So you've got to break down the blood retinal barrier to allow the CAR T cells in. Uh, Dr. Jose, uh, I have one question. Many a times we uh, know it's lymphoma when we see a clinical picture. We think it's lymphoma. Biopsy comes on negative. MRI is such is negative. Do you consider sometimes giving a trial of intravitreal rituximab in such cases or a methotrexate in which you think it can yeah. be? So, you know, 14 years ago, it was pretty common to have that problem. But with this mighty 88 L265 P PCR, the number of negative cases is much less. Because they would tell you, and you've probably seen this, um, well, there's some degenerated cells, we don't know what they are. The PCR doesn't care whether they're degenerated cells or not, because the DNA still has that, PC, that mutation in it, and that's all you need. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Palido. The next speaker is Dr. William Miller. He's the vice chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Miller, please. Since we, in the interest of time, I would request all to keep the questions to the end of the session. And uh, we have three more talks to go after Dr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, a pleasure to be here. I, I have no financial disclosures. You know, years ago, we would treat melanomas with uh, enucleation or brachytherapy or charged particle radiation. We would talk about clinical risk factors for metastatic disease. 
patient age, the older the patient, the greater the risk of metastases, size of the tumor, in particular the thickness of the tumor, the location in the eye, the so-called most anterior border, the more anterior, the closer to the ciliary body, the worse in the prognosis, or the greater the chance that the patient may develop metastatic disease. If you look at tumors in this category, and if patients are monitored for five to 10 years, over half the patients will develop evidence of metastatic disease. So it's a problem that occurs very frequently. We can look at pathology, histopathology. We know that you know, spindle A, spindle B, epithelioid type cells can be encountered in the course of these groups. The spindle, I'm sorry, the epithelioid tumors tend to have the worsened prognosis for eventual development of metastatic disease. There's clinical features of so-called tumor activity. Obviously, if there's documented growth, if there's a breakthrough Brooks membrane, presence of subretinal fluid, relatively sparse drusen on the surface of a lesion, all these things imply that there is greater tumor activity, and you might presume that there is a worsened prognosis or a greater chance of metastatic disease, but yet not all these things truly do correlate with that finding, but certainly it makes us more suspicious that the patient will have a greater chance of problems developing down the road. We also have the small tumors, you know, some risk factors have been identified looking for growth of these tumors, and of course small tumors can eventually evolve into larger tumors. And the features such as the thickness, the presence of fluid, location in the eye, you know, close to the optic nerve are all things that increase the risk of eventual growth. If there's uh, no risk factors, roughly a 3% chance of the tumor growing inside the eye, not necessarily escaping the eye, but if they have two or more risk factors, that's a 50-50 chance the tumor will continue to grow and eventually, of course, could lead to a medium or large sized tumor, then have the risk factors of systemic metastatic disease. Over the past, uh, well, basically eight years or you know, maybe 12 years, uh, things have really changed to genetic prognostication, trying to determine what patients truly have risks for growth, metastatic disease, et cetera. And the one problem we still have, of course, today is that the one thing we have much, much better predictive factors in terms of risk of metastatic disease, but we still don't have wonderfully great treatments for development of metastatic melanoma. That work, of course, will catch up eventually. Once again, patients monitored long enough and kept in a single location. A couple of studies coming out of these Scandinavian countries where patient population bases are relatively stable. Half the patients develop metastatic disease over a five to 10 year time frame. So initially work centered around the analysis of chromosomal abnormalities, then gene mutations, and finally gene expression profile. We'll talk about these different tests for determining metastatic disease. So once again, we can look at tumor histopathology, cytology, chromosomal studies, gene expression profiling, molecular targeting, and even identifying circulating tumor cells. Let's see how these fit into our analysis of patients with metastatic disease. Well, there are definitely chromosomal abnormalities associated with a higher risk of developing metastatic disease. Uh, abnormalities of chromosome 1, 3, 6, 8, 11, or 13. Far and away, the most uh, worrisome feature are those associated with monosomy 3. Uh, we can get tissue, of course, via enucleation, or if we're trying to preserve vision, with a final aspiration biopsy. Recognize that when we talk about gene profile assays, the tissue has to be obtained before radiotherapy is applied. It has to be fresh tissue. It can be embedded in paraffin, but it has to be non-irradiated tissue. So chromosome 3, monosomy, risk of metastases, roughly a 25% risk. And if you, um, as high as even 50% at a five-year time frame. So Monosomy 3 is certainly a uh, adverse factor to be found in terms of chromosomal analysis. Now, do we do this routinely today? The answer is really no, because tests have replaced this issue of uh, chromosome analysis. So recognize that chromosome, uh, monosomy chromosome 3 is certainly a adverse prognostic factor. And the problem, once again, is if a patient does have this, you say, well, we need to follow you more carefully, more closely, surveillance. But do we have effective treatment outside of clinical trials, once again, that certainly is quite sparse at the present time. We look at genes and downregulation, uh, specific genes uh, causing downregulation of key tumor suppressors on chromosomal 3 obviously play a role, and then there's actually upregulation on the chromosome 8Q, once again, as a predictive factor for a higher risk of metastatic disease. And then there's genes that may disseminate melanoma cells. BAP1 is probably the most commonly recognized and encountered, but these other things as listed on the slide uh, GNAQ and the other entities also carry a risk of uh, dissemination of melanoma. So if these are found in the patient, they have a higher risk of metastatic disease. So it brings us to multi-gene expression profile, or GEP. 
Uh, multiple genes are most likely involved in the development of metastatic melanoma. Work by Onkin and Harbour started in the early 2000s, publications up to the present time frame, developed a 15 gene microassay with three control genes, and they basically categorized tumors into class 1A, class 1B, or class 2. And of course, 1A, 1B have the uh, better prognosis, class 2 has the highest risk of metastatic disease. This multi gene test uh, decision, uh, DXUM, uh, has been available since 2009. One scan of patient's tumor via finding lab aspiration biopsy or via enucleation specimen. Class 1A carries about a 2% risk of metastatic development by five years. Class 1B, 21%. Class 2, somewhere between 50 and 72%. So the risks obviously are much higher with the class 2 tumors. The producer of this bioassay, Castle Biosciences, is now actually offering an additional testing to assess the expression of what's called PRIM, preferentially expressed antigen in melanoma gene. This is being evaluated at the present time. It's an ongoing multicenter clinical trial. I felt to be uh, even a bit more sensitive than the initial uh, 15 gene assays. So this is something that you read about in the upcoming months and years. Now the 15 gene assay was tested through the uh, Collaborative Ocular Oncology Group, published initially in 2012. And this is where these tests were basically verified in terms of their risk of metastatic disease. These tests did not include the BAP1 gene as part of the initial 15G microassay array, but we recognize now that that is critically important. So BAP1 codes for an enzyme that binds to BRAC1 or BARD1, created in this heterodynamic, heterodimeric tumor suppression complex. Inactivation of this BAP1 gene uh, is found or has been described in up to roughly 84, 85% of these class two tumors, so the presence of BAP1 is of high significance. I just saw a patient earlier this week, a family with BAP1, a physician who I've been monitoring for the last year, six members of the family, one member died of uveal melanoma metastases, three died of mesotheliomas, and so it's a very aggressive issue in these patients that's a very challenging to control. It's kind of a time bomb sitting off in the patient, so BAP1 is critically important to assess. Um, these tests have been looked at. The uh, micro, uh, this uh, gene expression profiling is, is more sensitive than chromosome 3 alone. And other clinical studies have now correlated tumors that have a base of greater than 12 have a, a very high risk of metastatic disease. Of course, we knew that from previous clinical trials as well. Other things forthcoming, other molecular profiling, multiple ligation-dependent probe amplification, karyotype analysis, fluorescence in situ hybridization and comparative genomic hybridization are all tests that have been formulated, once again, hopefully even more sensitive in terms of detecting patients' risk for metastatic disease. Molecular targeting is forthcoming as well. These are all things that really are not yet prime time players, but things that to watch for in the near future. The issue of assessment of peripheral blood cytology, once again, at the present time, not highly reliable. we has been gone and going for the past 15 years. This is something that you know, may play a role in the future. If we could detect with significant you know, accuracy uh, the presence of cells, that would be highly useful, but just that the present time is not available. MEK inhibitors, uh, mitogen activated protein kinase inhibitors, improve survival in patients with cutaneous melanoma, but not so much with patients with uveal melanoma because of the presence of the hepatitic stromal cell resistance. So some of our patients are still treated with MEK inhibitors, but it's not nearly as effective as patients who have cutaneous melanoma. So once again, the issue of detecting these issues is great. Now we have to have better treatments to be able to provide a better outcome. A uh, number of agents are being looked at, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, various stages of clinical trials. Some of the agents are listed at the bottom of this slide. Uh, at the present time, these, some of these entities will prolong life by a number, of, a number of months, but still we're lacking a cure of this situation. If someone has metastases lo locally, let's say, for example, to the uh, liver, sometimes you can do like surgical resection, infusion therapy, and they, they can have success in that situation. But still, when there's widespread disease, it's a very troubling problem. So in summary, genetic markers, gene expression, microarray, profiling through Castle Biosciences, <clears throat> the work of Ontech and Bill Harbour have been very instrumental in our improvement and detection of metastatic uh, risk. These studies certainly play a key role in surveillance and to some extent management, but we still need better targeted therapies to be able to treat the patients who have metastatic disease. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insightful lecture, Dr. Nina. Okay, so 
Uh, Dr. Meela has to leave for the wet lab, and uh, I request Dr. Santosh to go on to the next talk yep, on yep. advanced retinal blastoma. I, I, I promised I would partake in their wet lab, so if there's right. a couple questions, I'd be happy to if you got the time. Okay. So if there are any questions for Dr. Meela, we can take them now. Looks like uh, no. Thank you so much. I right, thank you. Good morning. I'll be speaking about uh, the current management of advanced retinoblastoma. I would define advanced retinoblastoma as one where there is risk for either salvage of the eye or salvage of life. In India, about 75% of patients present to us with advanced retinoblastoma. Standard chemotherapy works very well for early retinoblastoma. But for advanced retinoblastoma, the chance of eye salvage is as low as 25%. The options that we have are clearly intra-arterial chemotherapy or high-dose chemotherapy. Intra-arterial chemotherapy works very well where an uh, interventional neuroradiologist would get us access to the ophthalmic artery, after which we inject a cocktail of three drugs right into the ophthalmic artery, topoticam, melphalan, and carboplatin. Generally, three cycles of intra-arterial chemotherapy is required for every child. A child with total retinal detachment settles with one cycle of intra-arterial chemotherapy and the residual tumor, of course, is amenable to focal therapy. This is one more child with total retinal detachment, settled on after two cycles of intra-arterial chemotherapy and the residual tumor is very well calcified. These are similar examples of how effective intra-arterial chemotherapy is in the management of advanced retinoblastoma, often with salvage of vision, as in this child, macula was affected the tumor moved away from the macular fovea, thereby maximizing visual potential. In patients who have tumor recurrence following intravenous chemotherapy, intra-arterial chemotherapy works. This was a child where there was tumor and vitreous seed recurrence following intravenous chemotherapy. Following intra-arterial chemotherapy, tumor settled down into a stable scar. There's about 83% eye salvage overall with intra-arterial chemotherapy in advanced retinoblastoma, but when we use it as a salvage protocol where we have failed intravenous chemotherapy and then use intra-arterial chemotherapy, the chance of eye, eye salvage is less at about 58%. Short of intra-arterial chemotherapy, we can use a combination of high-dose chemoreduction and periocular chemotherapy. The same group of drugs, carboplatin, etoposide, and vincristine can be used along with periocular carboplatin or topotican. These are examples of patients where high-dose chemotherapy protocol was employed with impressive results. The next domain where uh, obviously we needed much, needed much better results was in the area of vitreous seeds. We could use periocular chemotherapy for vitreous seeds, carboplatin and topotican, but the results are not very good. 75%, 63% chance of remission of vitreous seeds with periocular chemotherapy coupled with systemic chemotherapy. But with intraocular chemotherapy or intravitreal chemotherapy, there are very impressive results. Melphalan has been very effective, but has complications, especially in pigmented races such as ours. There is a chance of cataract, uveitis, and posterior sinicia, thus precluding visualization of the tumor. So we have shifted over to intravitreal topotican. Topotican is very gentle to the eye, does not cause uveitis, does not, does not cause cataract, yet is very effective. 30 microgram is the dose that we use by a safety-enhanced injection technique this is one example where a bunch of vitreous seeds have gone away with two injections of intravitreal topotican. This was a child with diffuse vitreous seeds left out after complete reduction or calcification of the main tumor itself. After two injections of intravitreal topotican, you can see that the vitreous seeds have all gone away. This is how effective intravitreal topotican is in the management of vitreous seeds in retinoblastoma. This is a child with diffuse cloud of vitreous seeds after two doses of intravitreal topotican. Whatever that is left is a retinal tumor that is amenable to TTT. One more similar example. Intravitreal topotican works invariably in all patients. Although the effect may not be very sustained in terms of the fact that there are about 20% of patients who may recur following completion of treatment. After about six months or nine months, they may have a small recurrence, focal recurrence, 
which can again be treated with intravitreal topotecan as this child was. This was a case of recurrence of retrocedes following completion of intravitreal topotecan after nine months, treated yet again with intravitreal topotecan and the retrocedes settled down. This we reported initially we had 100% success with topotecan, but with now with the extended indications where we're using it for difficult cases, our success rate has come down to about 90% which is still good considering the fact that the only option that we had earlier was external beam radiation. There are situations of this sort where there is bilateral retinoblastoma. One eye has a large macular tumor which needs immediate treatment for salvage of vision. Other eye, we are waiting to enucleate. This eye has neovascular glaucoma. But oftentimes we find that the eye with a difficult situation of neovascular glaucoma regresses completely. Neovascularization of the iris goes away intraocular pressure settles down and the tumor calcifies. This happens and encouraged by that, if you are to salvage an eye, there is about 50 to 60% chance that you may be able to salvage an eye with neovascular glaucoma unless there are risk factors such as optic nerve invasion or choroidal invasion, which we evaluate by MRI and then such eyes are primarily enucleated. These are children with anterior segment seeds with retinoblastoma. If these are depository seeds without infiltration of the iris and ciliary body or trabecular meshwork, then we can use intracameral topotecan. Intracameral topotecan is effective in managing anterior segment seeds. As you see here, retinal tumor, of course, was treated with intra-arterial chemotherapy. Following that, the residual anterior chamber seeds were treated with intracameral topotecan. This is an anterior variant of retinoblastoma where there is no obvious retinal tumor, just the seeds in the anterior chamber and above the lens and in the anterior chamber angle. This child was treated only with intracameral topotecan. Child needed three injections after which the entire anterior chamber seeds have completely cleared. Fourth concept is that enucleation is not the end of clinical management of advanced retinoblastoma. Of course, you have to do a enucleation with a long optic nerve stump and use a primary implant so that the child gets prosmosis. But what is really important is that we should look for histopathological high risk factors, which are iris or trabecular meshwork invasion, ciliary body extension, choroidal invasion more than three millimeter in diameter or three millimeter in thickness, and optic nerve invasion beyond the lamina cribrosa, the chance of which is about 50% in Indian eyes. All these patients should receive post-enucleation adjuvant chemotherapy or radiation if there is full thickness scleral invasion or optic nerve transaction involvement. If these children are given adjuvant therapy, then the chance of metastasis drops down to 4% from 24%. So there is a clear benefit of about 20% life salvage in these patients if you were to identify high risk factors following enucleation and were to provide adjuvant therapy. The last bit is about orbital retinoblastoma, which was a dangerous disease because 70% of these children succumb to uh, orbital retinoblastoma if they were to undergo primary orbital exenteration. These patients are currently managed with multimodal treatment protocol, where we begin with high-dose chemotherapy. This is a child with orbital retinoblastoma. After high-dose chemo reduction or neoadjuvant protocol, we find that the eye has gone into thysis, as you see here, at which point in time you would enucleate with a long optic nerve stump deliver stereotactic radiation to the orbital microscopic residual, and then follow it up with adjuvant chemotherapy for a total of 12 cycles. This is a child with orbital retinoblastoma with extension to the cavernous sinus, earlier considered unsalvageable. Now with new adjuvant chemotherapy, what is left is right at the superior orbital fissure, amenable to stereotactic radiation, and of course the eye can be enucleated with a long optic nerve stump. This is a child with Optic nerve invasion of retinoblastoma. You can see the optic nerve involvement right up to the orbital apex. You cannot do a safe enucleation in this situation. There would be residual tumor at the optic nerve cut end. In these patients, when you use neoadjuvant treatment protocol, you can see that the optic nerve caliber actually returns to normal in about three to six cycles, after which you can do a safe enucleation. These children can now be provided with cosmosis because you're not doing primary orbital excentration and managing them conservatively initially followed by a minimalistic surgery such as enucleation. With all these protocols in place, we have much better life and eye salvage currently. 36% of patients still need primary enucleation, but when chemotherapy of some form is, appli of, is applied, about 90% is the eye salvage, and many of them continue to live on with good vision. These are cost-effective protocols, and they can be definitely used in the management of retinoblastoma with much better prognosis. Thank you, sir.
Thank you, Dr. Santosh, for that uh, excellent update on uh, the current advances in the management of retinoblastoma, especially advanced retinoblastoma. And uh, next, I invite Dr. Bikramjit Pal, who is a practitioner in Kolkata, for his talk on an update on vascular tumors. Uh, so very good morning. So I'll be talking about a uh, gist of a few vascular tumors that we come across. So as you know, vascular tumors can be ocular, uh, it can be extraocular, which are orbital. And I'll be mostly talking about those which are present in the posterior segment of the ocular part, intraocular part. So the most common that we come across sometimes in a young child is uh, Coats disease. Now Coats disease can present itself in myriad of fashions. It can be as subtle as few hard exudates. So this child was examined because the elder sibling has a coat disease we had treated. So this uh, mother wanted his younger son to get uh, checked. And uh, somehow we found few hard exudates in the macula. And on inspection, we found uh, telinjectetic vessels in the inferior quadrant. So we are lucky to have such patients if we see them early. But many a times, we don't see them early, and we see them uh, quite late, like uh, total bullous retinal detachment, the retina just behind the lens. So, uh, the most, when you see such patients, it's very important to differentiate from a very dangerous sibling, uh, that's retinoblastoma, and often uh, we are able to differentiate clinical suspicion by looking into those specific telinjectetic vessels, as you see, uh, gives you the clue that what you're dealing with actually is coats and not retinoblastoma. And sometimes uh, the clinical presentation itself can tell you that, no, what you're dealing is actually coats. So the top left is actually a xanthocoria, which is typical of advanced coats, and a typical leukocoria is on the right side. Uh, in spite of sometimes if we are not able to diagnose, then ultrasound are sometimes helpful. So ultrasound in coats disease can have refractile uh, echoes, but those are due to cholesterol and not as clumpy as those seen as retinoblastomas, as seen uh, below. It's very important to do an angio in these coach disease because when we treat these children in younger, uh, in the early stage, it's very important to treat them, uh, treat the telangiectetic vessels and also the ovascular retina. So to treat them, the best is to treat the ovascular and telangiectetic vessels. So laser is applied only when there is, there is very le less amount of uh, subretinal fluid. If a lot of subretinal fluid is there, then we need to do cryotherapy. anti vegf is useful as an adjunct. And sometimes you need to do surgery to drain the subretinal fluid just to salvage the eye. So the top, uh, the bottom is the same patient that we operated. We, deal, we did a subretinal fluid exchange, a subretinal fluid drainage, and put an insaclage and did cryo. Child did not have great vision, but at least the globe was salvaged. Coming to the second most uh, common tumor that we come across in adults is the circumscribed choroidal hemangioma. So typical appearance of an orange-red lesion is quite uh, suggestive of hemangioma. But sometimes we do come across cases, uh, the top left, where we are not sure what we are dealing with. So in these cases, it's very important to differentiate from two tumors. One is a melanotic choroidal melanoma, and second is a choroidal metastasis. To differentiate from a melanoma, it's useful to do an ultrasound, where we don't find a acoustic hollowness, which you very commonly find in a melanoma. And uh, we regularly employ little uh, lesions, which are little uh, more up to three millimeters, an enhanced depth OCT because uh, OCT gives you a diagnosis quite often in early cases of metastasis, which they have a very lumpy, bumpy appearance. But in a case of a choroidal uh, uh, circumscribed hemangioma, there is a subtle elevation, and there is a preservation of the inner RP, inner choriocapillaris layer, which is not there in any other tumors. In early melanoma also might give you such subtle elevation, but there is a destruction of the inner RP choriocapillaris layer, which is present in a case of a choroidal hemangioma. So uh, the treatment is quite, uh, uh, if you are, you need not treat all the choroidal hemangioma, especially if they are not leaking and in a very precarious position, such as in a juxtapapillary area. When you do need to treat, you can either use a, uh, the best modality is a PDT, which you can employ either as a single spot or maybe in an overlapping fashion. If you don't have access to PDT and the lesion is small, you can do a transpupillary thermotherapy, but you need to repeat it quite again. Anti VEGF again is not the sole modality of treatment. You need to use as an adjunct along with any other treatments that you do. And of course, if you have access to plaque and uh, if the lesion is not uh, is recurring quite a lot and is recalcitrant, a plaque can also be used. 
It's dangerous version, which I, uh, which sometimes is very difficult to appreciate, is a diffuse choroidal hemangioma, because uh, these are so subtle that sometimes you might miss it. So the best clue to identify a diffuse choroidal hemangioma, if the the patient does not have a Serge Weber, is to look at the better eye. The better eye definitely gives you a clue. If you find something that this eye is appearing more orange, look into the better eye, and it provides you a clue. Uh, OCT will, uh, the ultrasound generally gives you a uh, irregular thickening of the uh, ocular coats, and ultrasound is generally used to identify the thickest part of the diffuse hemangioma, especially when you are trying to do a PDT, where you need to use the PDT to the most thickest part. And while investigating, it's better to use a MRI over a CT because it's great for soft tissue and, uh, uh, assessment. Most of these sometimes don't leak, so observation is uh, quite a great modality of uh, treatment. Medical management. Uh, now a lot of papers are there which talks about use of oral propofol uh, or of propofol for uh, use of uh, in this treatment. So I don't have any personal experience with propofol, and uh, the best modality of treatment is external beam radiotherapy, which generally, especially in cases which have bilateral diffuse hemangioma, and anti vegf is again an adjunct. Most important, don't forget the optic nerve head because these patients are very prone to develop glaucoma. So always uh, look for glaucoma and try to treat them as uh, also along with your retinal treatment. So this is a very frustrating tumor, a retinal capillary hemangioblastomas, because you see literally patient lose vision in front of your eyes. And especially if there are multiple, then no matter what you do, you, try, you somehow lose the vision. So uh, whenever you see a capillary hemangioblastoma, most important is to take the blood pressure in your clinic because most of the times they have an elevated BP which just goes unnoticed. So uh, load the location, presence of traction, what's the visual potential, and you must do a fundus fluorescein angiography even in unilateral cases because very subtle, hema subtle hemangiomas are diagnosed when you do an angiogram. Always investigate and ask for MRI with spinal cord when you're ordering with the brain because a lot of these hemangiomas are also in the cerebellum which can cause the death of this patient. Most important, don't forget to do a USG abdomen because most common cause of death is renal carcinoma. And ask for a family history too. So uh, if the lesions are less than three millimeters, I generally do a laser. And uh, it should be generally long duration, less power, just blanch the lesion. If they are quite big, uh, with a lot of subretinal fluid, use a cryotherapy. Plaque is best if you have the access to that. And if you had a large tumor with a lot of SRF, and sometimes we do need to do vitrectomy if there is associated significant vitreous hemorrhage or traction. But vitrectomy and retinal detachment surgery are not easy, and uh, they are sometimes we do lose these eyes. Second last tumor is what we don't come across commonly, but we do see it, which is the cavernous hemangioma. They have a very typical appearance. And if you do an angiogram, they have a typical fluorescein capsign lesion. And most of them don't leak. Sometimes they do leak uh, in a juxtapapillary area then you might need to do a laser. Very rarely do they have vitreous hemorrhage where you need to do a vitrectomy. And uh, they are very prone to develop ERM, and if they are causing distortion, you might need to do a surgery to remove them. The last tumor that we come across is a vasoproliferative tumor, which can be either a primary or a secondary tumor. And uh, here, that you, the typical appearance is a very fleshy, angry-looking uh, lesion which is present in the periphery with sort of a feeder vessel. But these feeder vessels are a little different from what you see in a capillary hemangioblastomas. So the best modality, if you ask me, is plaque. A single low uh, plaque with less dose generally uh, dries them off. But if not, then cryotherapy. Remember not to use excessive cryo because they can cause a lot of vitreous traction and second retinal detachment. anti vegf can be used. This is a patient in which we did cryo and he developed a, quite a significant macular edema. We gave anti vegf to reduce the load of uh, anti vegf and uh, along with that, we did cryotherapy. Laser may or may not be applied depending upon the size of the lesion. So what do we have in the future? How is OCT angiography? A lot of papers are there which are telling it helps in early diagnosis, but still it's not commonly used. Recently, a lot of papers are talking about use of optical density of the subretinal fluid, which they say are more, uh, the density, optical density is more in cases of choroidal melanoma when compared to other tumors. It's, invest it's a new and interesting investigative tool uh, which might have a bright pr prospective use uh, if many people use it. And most important, how easy is availability of plaques, especially in India, 
where uh, not many people have access to ruthenium. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. So our last speaker is Dr. Prithvi Mridhunjay, who is a professor at Byers Eye Institute at Stanford. Thank you. Yeah, second dose, after first of? dose. Of topotecan. Topotecan. Yeah, and topotecan. And do you wait for chemo reduction, then you give topotecan, or you directly give right. when When there is active retinal tumor, you're not supposed to enter into an eye with active retinal tumor, so you don't give intravitreal injection. Right. You do periocular injection. Once the retinal tumor is completely or nearly totally regressed, then you would enter into the vitreous, giving intravitreal injection. Right. So do you Dose is 30 microgram topotecan. And how often? What interval? One month or something? Three weekly. Three weekly. Okay. And uh, do you augment with laser or cryo also post topotecan? Post intervitreal topotecan? Cryo? No. Yeah, cryo or laser? No. no. Nothing. No. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll be talking today about strategies to manage radiation retinopathy, and I have no um, relevant financial disclosures. So we know that radiation retinopathy is a delayed onset occlusive microangiopathy, which is slowly progressive and, and indolent in these patients. And plaque therapy, we know through the COM study, can lead up to 45% of patients having severe loss of vision by three years after treatment. And in this study by Gundes et al., um, we can see that within a year after treatment, about 95% of patients uh, will not have signs of retinopathy, but if you go up to five years, uh, more than 50% uh, will. So this is something that over time we see a greater incidence of disease. Clinically, I think we're all familiar with what uh, this disease will show us, lipid exudation, the presence of macular edema, retinal telangiectasias, but also swelling of the optic nerve with optic neuropathy, retinal hemorrhages, uh, and neovascularization and complications of such. When we think about radiation toxicity, there's different compartments that we need to think about in terms of how we can strategize to, um, to eradicate this condition. One is the geometry of the tumor itself, the size, the location of the tumor. Second is the biology of the tumor, whether the, these tumors are known to secrete VEGF and also inflammatory mediators. The third is the direct damage to the, of the radiation itself caused by the isotope that's being used or the form of radiation and also the dose uh, of radiation that's coming into the eye. And finally, the retinal reserve. How much is this retina affected by comorbid vascular diseases of the retina? And the duration of exposure of the radiation, which tells us that over time, there is um, a greater incidence of this disease manifesting itself. When we have a disease that doesn't have a cure, there's kind of three approaches that we need to take. One is to characterize the problem. The second is to treat the condition as best as you can. And then third, think of strategies to prevent the condition altogether. So how do we characterize radiation retinopathy? And this is with, uh, with retinal imaging. So OCT um, has been used as the primary way to detect and to classify maculopathy. It allows early identification of macular edema, and progressive macular thickening has correlated with worsening visual acuity, and it's currently the main guide to direct therapy, such as anti-VEGF therapy or macular laser photocoagulation. OCTA is uh, shown to be a very interesting modality, though still not clinically relevant in radiation retinopathy. We can see that in eyes that have been treated with radiation, there is an increase in the size of the foveal avascular zone and decreased vessel densities, particularly in the deep capillary plexus. Here we can see an eye radiated um, that has mild retinopathy compared to the one on the right that shows a more severe retinopathy with a dropout of uh, superficial and deep vessels. So in radiation retinopathy, the damage that's seen on OCTA seems to pre-date um, what will be seen on ultimately on cross-sectional OCT and even before we see visual decline. And it seems to correlate in terms of the, deg the degree of dropout of vessels with the degree of the severity of vision loss. When we look at wide field angiography in eyes that have radiation maculopathy, we can see a lot of clinical features including capillary dropout, peripheral non-perfusion, and, and neovascularization. Tara McCannell has provided a grading system uh, that was developed based on 76 patients that were treated with iodine plaque radiation and imaged at the time of diagnosis and at last follow-up. And these five identifiable grades um, 
provided uh, a predictor for advancing of retinopathy, including patients that had younger age, worsening visual acuity, macular thickening, and neovascular glaucoma. We've been interested in trying to quantify and correlate the fluorescein changes with radiation retinopathy that develops in patients. Here we see a patient that has radiation retinopathy with lipid exudation and fluorescein angi angiographic changes that show non-perfusion in the periphery. We looked at patients over an eight-year period that had ocular melanoma and, and had both pre- and last follow-up fluorescein images on wide field systems, and we attempted to quantitate the area of non-perfusion using a binary mask that allowed for a direct quantification of the areas of non-perfusion after treatment of the tumor. And what we basically found is that as you increase the, the area by millimeter squared of non-perfusion, the incidence of clinical radiation maculopathy as well as macular edema um, increase compared to those patients that did not have uh, as large areas of non-perfusion. So we found that wide field fluorescein angiography allows us to quantitate peripheral non-perfusion and over time the measured quantified area of, of non-perfusion predicts worsening vision, macular edema, and radiation retinopathy. Um, and this allows us to try to create a composite index for radiation retinopathy that could be used for entry criteria of patients into clinical trials. The second is to try to treat the condition itself. And there's been numerous ways that people have approached trying to treat radiation uh, retinopathy. And we'll touch on a few. So steroid therapy with direct um, injection of intravitreal triamcinolone acetonide. Uh, the shields in 2005 um, treated 31 eyes that had moderately good vision but signs uh, on OCT of radiation retinopathy and found that after um, one injection there was stabilization at one month of 91% of these patients with improved or stable vision, but over time this effect dwindles over time. So the question of using an extended delivery system of dexamethasone in the Osirdex implant um, has been approached, and this group from Italy um, looked at eight eyes that received anti-VEGF therapy versus the Osirdex and followed these patients for about two years and found that the ranibizumab group had about an eight-letter um, improvement of vision, and the dexamethasone group had a nine-letter improvement in vision, so showing some equivalence in the efficacy of both of those treatments. Here's a patient treated three years ago with plaque therapy and, and TTT, showed a, so there's a regressed tumor with good vision. Um, the patient then de develops over time the signs of radiation uh, retinopathy with cotton wool spots, but no macular edema, but give it some more time, and now we see greater retinopathy and, and macular edema. And this patient was then um, treated with uh, intravitreal bevacizumab with three injections with excellent resolution, but the question is, is this enough? And is this patient at risk for developing more uh, radiation retinopathy? So uh, looking at intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy, Paul Finger has been treating patients since about 2005. Um, and in a study of 99 eyes of 120 patients treated with between a Q4 and 12-week um, regimen, he found that there was a mean uh, treatment interval of about 38 months in his study, and maculopathy was found to be progressive on treatment despite aggressive use of anti-VEGF therapies, and 49% of these patients required actual dose escalation. But in this process, only about 20% of his patients lost more than three lines of acuity. If we look at this patient with a peripapillary uveal melanoma that was treated with a notched plaque, um, the uh, patient at 34 months after treatment starts to develop decreased vision, and was entered into Amy Scheffler's RRR trial of ranibizumab, uh, treatment um, for radiation retinopathy, and over a series of 24 months has resolution of any macular edema and preservation of vision. And this is a prospective randomized phase two study that was comparing uh, monthly ranibizumab with PRN extension plus or minus use of peripheral laser. And at six and 12 months recently reported, visual acuity improved by about six letters in the monthly injection group with the reduction in central macular thickening. And finally, are there ways that we can prevent this condition altogether? So again, if we look at the various components of what causes radiation toxicity, we can think of different ways and strategies to try to reduce uh, any one or multiple of these factors. One might be the preventative use of anti-VEGF therapy. So two studies come to mind. One is by Ivana Kim in patients that receive uh, proton beam radiotherapy and were receiving ranibizumab injections at two monthly intervals. And they found that there was uh, clinical evidence of radiation retinopathy that was reduced in patients that received these frequent injections compared to historical controls. 
In a second study uh, by the Wills Group using bevacizumab given at four month intervals, they found that at 24 months there was a, a statistically significant decrease in OCT graded radiation retinopathy in these patients, suggesting that there is a role for frequent uh, delivery of anti-VEGF therapy. We've been interested in the use of modulating the amount of radiation delivered into the eye, and we know that currently the COM standard uh, is to apply 85 gray of radiation to the apical height of the tumor given over three to five days. And our group has, has historically treated at a dose lower than that, and we're interested in looking at our outcomes. And we reported recently um, on two different studies. One is looking at patients that had non uh, peripapillary tumors, and we found that um, in delivering a lower dose than the typical COMS studies, that we found that there was an improvement in preserving um, severe vision loss in patients with lower radiation doses. So by essentially decreasing the apical dose by 20% in these patients, we're getting equivalent local tumor control and reduction of retinopathy by about 18%. And when we looked at patients with peripapillary tumors, we found, again, good um, local tumor control, similar final visual acuity, but decrease in retinopathy events in the patients with lower group, lower dose um, radiation. So radiation retinopathy does not have a cure, but there are numerous opportunities. One is to enhance imaging biomarkers to predict retinopathy. The second is to prospectively study the ideal anti-VEGF or steroid therapies that we should use. And finally, better ways to optimize radiation exposure to the eye and maybe finding treatments better than radiation that can cure these tumors. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we come to the conclusion of the symposium. I thank the audience, my speakers, and uh, my co-chair, Dr. Santosh Mava. Thank you so much.